So then it's a quarter past four. And as promised, we have a little extra number, a bonus number, uh, a bonus talk uh, this afternoon uh, from Alexei Milko, who we already introduced uh, yesterday. Um, he has quite a big career behind him and, and probably lots to do for going forward as well. Uh, he's worked for several oil companies as both a geoscientist and, and senior manager. He's worked in conventional and unconventional oil and gas in all over the world, basically. And uh, he's now a full process professor at the Colorado School of Mines currently, and also does in parallel consultancies uh, for many companies and organizations across the world. So welcome back, Alexei, and um, I'll just give the floor to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my file in a second. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Very good. Yeah, so um, thanks for having me back. <laughs> uh, so today uh, we're going to do something different from yesterday. So yesterday we talked about pre-drill assessments uh, of probability of success and volumes assessment and comparison with uh, drilling results. And, you know, most of you do this, right? And uh, And that's great. It's been our practice for quite a long time. And when I started working with BP, we already did that, right? So I'm just basically, I did not invent anything new for that, just some highlights. Now for today, I'm going to talk about determination of key failure modes for segments in conventional petroleum prospects. And this is something that we also do, right? But I don't know what your experience is with this. My experience as a manager, uh, technical manager, exploration manager, is that you know there is very little consistency in this process, right? Just like there is little consistency in assessments of the risks, there is little consistency in the assessment of failure modes. So I've been through multiple companies and multiple presentations and in this type of discussions, and I struggled, right? Because these discussions can be long, people can have different opinions, and all the biases come back just as they do in resource assessments, right? So, um, and for me as a manager, you know, I always try to, you know, help people to avoid biases, and unfortunately, the only way to do it is to create a process, right? There's like no other way. And um, so what I'm going to show you is a process that I created to determine the key failure mode for uh, exploration prospects. And I'll explain, you know, why it's important, right? So hopefully you will see at the end that consistency in, in this workflow is very important. So dry holes, right? So dry holes are nothing new, right? Unfortunately, we don't usually like talking about them much. So for example, just think about your education and going to conferences on petroleum just science and history of petroleum just science, right? You all probably familiar with this well. It's called Drake well, and you know officially it's the first discovery well in the US. It's not really right, but kind of that's the well that everybody talks about as a start of petroleum industry in the US in 1859, right? So everybody has seen this picture and knows Drake, Drake well. Now, not many people know about this well. It's called the Grandin well, um, and this well, you can consider it as a first official dry hole in the US, right? What's interesting about this Grandin well, and Grandin well is the name of the person who drilled this well, right? Uh, what's interesting is it's in the same play as the Drake well. Uh, it's uh, this Vananga Sands, Devonian Sands in, in Pennsylvania, and it did not find the reservoir, right? So it basically was the first official dry well. And, you know, as, as this, um, Science says, you know, it shows risks involved in oil drilling, right? So dry holes is nothing uh, new to us. Now, what's important philosophically is not to get into this mindset. And this is cartoonish, right? I know it's probably not happening, um, you know, in many cases right now, but, you know, 20, 50 years ago, that's kind of what was happening, right? So people were punished for uh, drilling dry holes. Now, people still can be punished for drilling dry holes <laughs> uh, if, uh, you know, you, you all know the stories. On the other hand, we need to understand that dry holes are actually 
very important for exploration business, right? Very important for exploration business. This is a quote. Uh, if you want to read it, read it. If not, uh, it's a long quote. It's a quote from Wallace Pratt. So Wallace Pratt is, you know, one of these uh, iconic petroleum geoscientists in the US, in the APG. He's behind this phrase that, you know, oil is first found in the minds of, you know, men, women, petroleum explorers. Uh, but he also said that about dry holes. He basically said that dry holes is, even if it fails, well, dry holes fa fail by definition, when they fail, they're still new and vastly exciting experiment to geologists, right? And that's exactly what it is. Because before you drill the well, you basically have a model, right? And the model is a pre-drill model of what you imagine is happening in the subsurface. And when you drill the well, you basically test your model. So essentially, you're making an experiment, right, to see if your predictions, pre-drill predictions were actually correct. So, and when you, um, when you drill a dry hole, it's a waste of money for your investor, for your company, yes, but it's not a waste of money for you as an explorer. You actually get an, an information from that dry hole, right? So uh, at the end, right, the industry, the entire industry gets compensated for its dry holes, right? And this is a very powerful idea. It's nothing new, right? But it's really a good mindset that, that you need to approach your dry holes with, right? It's disappointing, yes. But it's more disappointing if you don't learn from it, <laughs> right? You have to learn from your dry holes. And that's how the whole industry is going to be compensated for it. And simple example is, you know, recent Guyana story, right? Be before, uh, before Lisa discovery happened, and, you know, at least three companies hugely benefited from it, ExxonMobil and uh, Sinoc and uh, uh, Hess, there were 60 dry holes in the basin offshore offshore dry holes, right? So obviously, I you know people learn from it, from, from these dry holes. Now, we can learn about, what, what can we actually learn from dry holes? Uh, numerous things, uh, and one of them is a failure mode. One of them is a failure mode. So failure modes are essentially reasons why the wells failed. And uh, there are some publications, there are some reports talking about, you know, why, why most of the wells fail in exploration. So, for example, there's a very good paper from ExxonMobil when they looked back at uh, their wells, and these are, you know, hundreds of wells, and basically found that, you know, most wells fail for trap and seal, right? So, basically, you drill a well and there is no trap or seal. Now, I personally, I don't like the word trap because trap, for me, it's a combination of structure and reservoir and seal. So what I think that they mean essentially here is a structure, closure, right, geometry. Um, and then petroleum systems, right, and then reservoir. So by petroleum systems, people mean presence of source rocks, uh, migration, maturity, so kind of combined. Now, this is a good start. Um, another good image from the paper is that, you know what, the failure modes actually are different for different stages of maturities of your place. So, for example, in a play test, we also call it frontier place, it's the petroleum system elements that most often fail, right? So, and that's easy to understand, right? So, you go into a new, completely new frontier play area and you don't even know if the source rock is actually there. It's in your model, right? You made assumptions about it. You made some calculations of your charge and migration, but you know all models are wrong, right? So your model potentially was also wrong on that aspect. And then as the play becomes more proven, and that's where you are in Norway, right? I mean, you're in mostly in proven place, so your source rocks <laughs> are proven to exist and work. You can argue about you know the quality of them and maturity and the amount of the charge, but usually you know your wells don't. Uh, fail much for that, but they can start failing more for, you know, presence of the seal or presence of the structure. If you go for smaller structures, right, usually you drill large bumps, large structures initially in the in the frontier place, but as you play becomes more mature, you're going for after something smaller, right? So this is kind of natural. We all understand that. I think you all can agree with that. Now, that's ExxonMobil. Uh, this is a more of a kind of global industry look. 
I mentioned this uh, workshop uh, on risk and uncertainty that we had in Copenhagen a few, few years ago. Again, people were asked, right, about the perceived cause of dry wells in unproven place and in proven place. And basically kind of the same pattern, right? So in an unproven place, in a frontier place, people think the charge is most often a failure mode and then reservoir and then seal and trap. And then in proven place, people think it's a seal and trap um, again, trap, right? People use trap closure, all right? Is probably as a more likely failure mode. So that's kind of consistent with uh, what we had on Exxon Mobil global uh, global experience. Now, in any specific areas, right? This would be different, right? So global statistics don't apply to specific areas, and that's where you know good data set from NPD comes into the play uh, when we look at. Um, statistics on failure modes in different not place but different areas I guess of the of the shelf all right so for example in the North Sea Norwegian North Sea it's 46 percent of wells fail for source and migration and in Barents Sea it's mostly mostly the trap now what's interesting about all these studies that I showed to you uh, in all of them the statistics are presented but there is no explanation on the process of how the failure modes were actually defined. And that's a big problem, right? There is like no way to go back and to see um, the methodology or even to know the methodology, how actually people, for example, in this NPD study, right? There is no explanation in the report how they decided why it's a reservoir failure mode or why it's a trap failure mode. There is no explanation. Maybe there is something hidden behind, right? And maybe if you talk to people from NPD, you're going to find out. But my point is, this is not unique, right? In Exxon paper, there was no explanation, right? In whatever, in this one, well, this was just an opinion, right? So, uh, so that's a missing link. In all papers about failure modes, people don't have a methodology to define the failure mode. So that's what I want to address today, because we actually try to close that gap and we created a decision tree to define the key failure mode. And I'm saying key failure mode, right? So I'm basically purposely saying we are going to define one key failure mode. There are reasons for that, right? We can have a discussion why we decided to go that way, but I'll, I'll explain that. So, so that's kind of what we're going to do today, right? So I'm going to explain that methodology and it's a published methodology. So I'll give you, I'll give you references uh, later on. Right, so basically you drill a dry well. Now I have to say that we do this uh, assessment at the level of segments, segments. So if you have, for example, a well in which you targeted, let's say three segments, and by segments I use GeoX, method, uh, um, um, GeoX definitions, but basically targets, zones, right? Let's say Jurassic sandstone, Triassic carbonates, you know, uh, myosin, um, microbial gas, whatever. So that's basically your three segments pre-drill that you evaluated. Even if you have a discovery well, right, in one of these segments came became successful, so you became have discovery well, two others still failed. So you basically have to take this analysis back to the segment level. So which means we evaluate segments, not just wells, right? That's the first thing. Now for each of these segments, when you uh, when you made a pre drill model, in this case risk model, right? You used, according to your company methodology, a certain number of risk factors. So my heritage is BP, so I'm using six, right? So for me, it's a structure, presence of reservoir fascias, reservoir durability, seal, mature source, and migration, right? Some companies use four, some companies use nine as Exxon Mobil. I think the right answer is seven because I want to split mature source into presence of the source and maturity. So that's kind of in my mind is the right number, but you know, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you start comparing your failure modes with your pre-drill risk model. So they should be completely the same, right? So that's the first step. And that's logical. Most people kind of would understand that. Now, another thing is, if you look at your risk model, right? There should be ideally one key failure mode, predicted failure mode, right? So that should be your risk factor with the lowest assigned probability of success, right? You say, for example, structure is 0.9, 
presence of reservoir fascia is one, reservoir durability is one, seal is 0.5, mature source 0.7, migration 0.8. So when you when you assign 0.5 to the seal, among all this, you basically say that if this well is going to fail, most likely it's going to fail for the lack of the seal. So it becomes your key failure mode. Pre-drill. Right? So ideally now, you see where I'm going with this, right? Ideally, ideally, if your well fail, if your segment fails, you want it to fail for the seal. Right? You won't basically connect your prediction predicted key failure mode with the actual failure mode. Right? What does it mean? It means that if that actually happens in many cases, you actually understand what you're doing with your subsurface evaluations, with your risk assessments. Because the opposite is, if you, let's say, in 30 wells, you predict that mostly seal is going to fail, but you mostly fail for reservoir, well, your predict your pre-drill models are consistently wrong on dry segments. So not only you did not find hydrocarbons, right, you also don't actually understand why your segments fail. And that has implications for your business decisions. All right, and management decisions. So, for example, if you predict that, you know, there will be no migration, let's say, uh, let's go the other way around. If you predict there will be no reservoirs in most cases, but there is no charge, there is no petroleum fluid, maybe you have too many sedimentologists on your staff and you need more petroleum systems people, right? Or you need training on petroleum systems, something like that. And the other way around, doesn't matter, right? You understand the principle. So, so this is very important, right? So that's why I want to drive the process to key failure mode and compare it to the pre-drill key failure mode because that actually generates data for business decisions, managerial decisions on what we need to do, right? Um, right. right, so that's one first step. Now, second step is definitions, right? Definitions of what is success and what is a failure for these different risk factors? Because if you don't have these definitions clearly written down and everybody understands what they actually mean, you're going to have lots of discussions in these meetings on failure mode because these discussions can be very long, right? On why the well failed because everybody has different ideas about the definitions of the failure mode. So the first step is to actually decide what is success and what is failure for each risk factor. So this is very cartoonish, you know, very simplified 2D, but you know, you, you, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So in this case, we're looking at structure, structure success, right? So let's say you have a pre-drill, which one is which? So you have pre-drill structure, which is, uh, you know, in 2D is this dashed line, and then you have post-drill structure, right? Which you remap after you drill the well, all right? And basically, here's a well, and you're on your post-drill mapping, right? The structure is there. The structure is there. So it's a success for the structure risk factor. Now, this is a dry hole, so there is no movable hydrocarbons, right? But the structure is present. So for this risk factor, it's a success. Now, this is a little bit deviation from this. Basically, your structure is there, but it's smaller. It's okay. It's still there, right? Because Fundamentally, when we do risk assessment, right, the question is, is the structure present or not? Not the size of the structure. The size of the structure is your uncertainty, and it goes into volumetric uncertainty of your resources. Now, that's my approach, right? So for me, risk is binary, and, um, you know, uh, and there is also uncertainty. I separate them. I know some companies combine them right away. I think it's wrong, but that's a different uh, conversation and longer conversation. So in this case, right, so the structure is smaller than you mapped it pre-drill, but it's still there. So if the hydrocarbons moved into this one, right, there would be a chance for, uh, for accumulation. This one is a little bit more uh, complicated situation for the well drilled off the crest of the structure, right? Um, now, in this case, again, you have to say there, the structure is there, now, the well is dry because it did not find hydrocarbons in this location, right? But maybe there is an accumulation up deep, right? So that's also always possible. Uh, so you can actually reevaluate this. In this, but but for structure presence, it's still a success. And in this case, the structure kind of moved into a different position from what you mapped, right? You know, things happen. But again, the structure is present, 
right at this location. It's just different shape, different form, different crest position, but it's still there. So in this case, it's all success. So what is the failure for the structure is as simple as this. There is no structure, right? So you mapped something and maybe it was a low closure structure, right? And then you uh, did your VSP, did your well logs, velocities analysis, whatever you do. And uh, in the post drill, you remap, oops, there is no structure, right? So that basically is a failure for the structure. Right? Now, why it can happen? Uh, multiple reasons. It all starts with interpretation, right? So uh, uncertainty in your interpretation uh, is very common. Um, you, you know, you, you have three geologists, you get four opinions. In this case, you have six interpreters who, uh, it's all paper, but still good, six interpreters who interpret seismic, uh, and you know the answers are all, all different, right, when it becomes more complicated. It's not a very good example, uh, but if you, if, you, if you work with partners, right, in JVs, and it's very common in Norway, right, you often have chance to compare your seismic peaks from different companies on the same prospect, and you know they're often different, right? Um, so that's interpretation uncertainty, so which comes from horizon peaking. Another uncertainty comes from your time depth conversion, which different companies do differently, and then from your gridding and from mapping. So these are kind of basic reasons why you know your structure may uh, may not show up where you predicted it's, where it's going to be. So that's structure. Uh, but my point is, you have to define what is a failure and what is success. Now, for reservoir presence, that's easy to do, right? So basically, you have a targeted segment. You predict it's going to be, you know, let's say sandstone reservoir. You drill through it, right? You don't find sandstone reservoir. That's obviously a failure. Now, if you find carbonate reservoir, it's kind of, it's not kind of not a failure, right? Because you found reservoir. Your facious prediction was wrong, so you know, make a note of that and use it going forward. But you found the reservoir, so it's not a failure. Um, that's simple. Now, it's kind of simple because people can deviate from this if there are no strict rules. Here's one good example of this. So, this is um, uh, so basically there is a study by Matthew on uh, UK uh, prospects, and he showed different pre-drill models and post-drill models. And I found this one is interesting. This is called Stefan and Prospect. And what's interesting about this is that they targeted that pumped sandstone channel that's a pre-drill model okay drill the well and what they found is this pond sandstone member equivalent which was relatively thin right only about six feet of net reservoir and the reservoir was actually not pond it was a different sand called leak member now what's interesting is that when you look at the failure mechanism that they determine is reservoir for this segment or for this well and i disagree because you know what they found the reservoir right the reservoir is different it's different name different stratigraphic member it's different thickness than they predicted but the reservoir is there right so for me it's actually not a reservoir failure so there was no charge and the structure was smaller so for me you know it would be a charge failure or than reservoir failure. But you see how easy it is to get into these type of discussions if you don't have the rules set up up front. So you need to kind of, you know, have these discussions before you come into your uh, failure mode sessions, right? It should be in your company process, right? So like in this situation, is it a reservoir failure mode or not? Because my interpretation is no, it's not a reservoir, but his interpretation it is. Obviously, it's a scientific geological discussion, so have that. And I don't care what the outcome is, because what's important is to have a consistent definitions of these rules on what is failure and what is not failure. So another one is uh, deliverability. If you have BP background, you're probably familiar with this. So basically, we separate um, presence of reservoirs from deliverability of reservoirs in the risk model. And I think it's proper because uh, there are different processes, geological processes, that affect presence of reservoir and uh, its uh, permeability and the viscosity of the fluid, which define if the reservoir is going to flow or not, right? So with that, 
success model is obviously we have a good reservoir, good porosity that actually can flow uh, the fluid of our choice, oil or gas, right? And the failure mode, if, if you have cemented sandstones or very low perm, or you have viscous heavy biodegraded oil, which also doesn't flow, right? So that would be two, you know, types of, of, of the failure. Seal. Seal is a little bit more difficult to um, uh, understand post-drill, because essentially we're looking at well logs, we're looking at cuttings, right? But in a simplistic sense, you're saying that, you know, above your sandstone reservoir, there will be shale that would serve as a seal. So you drill the well, you collect your cuttings, and you establish, or look at your well logs, and you establish if you have that seal or, or, or not, right? Or it can be, can be salt. In the opposite situation, basically, you drill the well, and above your sandstone targeted reservoir, you don't have good shale, right? You have seal stones and you see leaking hydrocarbons in your isotubes, right? So that would be the failure. Um, lateral seals. So lateral seals are a bit more complex um, because we usually don't drill wells like that, right? So we actually we usually don't drill wells to penetrate uh, the lateral seal. So we usually drill uh, down deep from the lateral seal. Now, if you do that, right, for some reason, whatever, and you basically see uh, that across the fold, you know, from your sandstone fascias, you have good sealing fascias, let's say shales, that's a success, right? You basically establish that lateral seal is working. And in this case, if you basically see sandstones on both sides and you see oil shows on both sides clearly showing migration and the fold not been sealing, that's clear failure, right? Now, in most situation, we drill, um, down deep from the folds in, in these three-way closures. So all we can see is, you know, if we have a reservoir and then we see, let's say, we see hydrocarbons, right? We see shows, we see them in the in the isotubes, right? And then we see uh, on seismic now validated with well logs that we actually have, uh, you know, sand on sand juxtaposition across the fold. So we have to assume that it's the lateral seal that actually failed. Right, so and that's where it becomes, you know, kind of failure by elimination, when everything is present and you still don't have an accumulation at the well location. Right, so maybe it has to be lateral seal. So because there's usually there is no direct identification, you will see how in the decision tree, I put it down the decision tree. So this is kind of the last mechanism to check, right, in the decision tree. You will see later on what I mean. And kind of the same idea for uh, lateral stratigraphic seals. So if you actually testing uh, the trap in this position, maybe you can actually see your top seal and bottom seal, maybe, well, not lateral seal, uh, but usually we don't do that, right? So um, again, you have to you have to rely on some kind of, you know, failure by elimination, right? When you see your reservoir being present and you see migrating hydrocarbons, and, but you still don't see accumulation, either you have a smaller column, which is always a possibility, or you completely leaked out, right? So it becomes uh, lateral stratigraphic seal failure. And this is an example from the same report on UK side. So that's a, that was a pre-drill model for uh, Dinatar prospect in the UK North Sea, when they basically uh, had a stratigraphic trap uh, on lapping on this KCF um, formation, and then they drilled it, and there was there was hydrocarbons, and there was uh, sandstones, uh, but there was no pay per se, right? So they basically assumed that probably um, that sealing mechanism laterally was not was not there. Um, source. So so that's the next risk factor, and the next the next potential failure mode that we check. And the complexity is that usually we don't drill for the source, right? That's usually not the objective. So if you drill through it and you find the source rocks and it's mature and it's, you know, high TOC, high hydrogen index, whatever your, your definitions for that, you basically say, yeah, success, this location, this segment has mature source, right? And if you drill through it and it's low TOC and low hydrogen index, you know, you say, well, it's, the source is not, is not good. Usually we don't have that, right? So usually you drill and you find some kind of, you know, migration evidences. Usually it's either tubes or maybe shows. And you say, well, if you have shows, if you have thermogenic gas in your either tubes, your source rock is mature, right? And it's working. And if you don't have that, you know, it's potentially an immature or absent or absent source, right? So you can make these inferences. 
And for migration, kind of the same idea, right? So if you have if you have hydrocarbons in your segment, obviously they migrated, right? If you don't, right, they did not migrate. Now, is it because the source is immature? Well, that's where you can kind of revisit your um, basin models, right? Because you collected temperature data now from your wells, so you can use that. Um, so you can you can do some thinking around this. And another one is timing, which is another possibility for fa mig migration failure, right? You need to look at the timing, especially in situations when you have everything in place and there is no accumulation, right? So maybe, you know, petroleum migrated when there was no structure, right? So you basically failed for, for the timing. So why I'm going through this um, cartoonish and simplified uh, things? Because the objective is to define what is success and what is failure. So you kind of, when you have the defined in your company, or if you use my definitions, if you agree with them, then everybody can get on the same page very quickly in regards to why the well failed, all right? Uh, because then it's as simple as using a decision tree. For example, decision tree like this one, right? So the object for this decision tree is to come up to the conclusion why the segment failed by looking at the data and doing it, you know, in a relatively quick uh, way. So you have a failed segment and the principle behind this decision tree is we ask the simplest questions first. And the simplest question is about reservoir fascias, right? Because you deal the well, you have your well logs, you have your cuttings, so you know if you have a reservoir or not, according to your definitions of success and failure, right? And basically, if you did not find reservoir fascias, if the answer is no, well, that's your failing mode. Now, if you found reservoir fascias, you move to the next thing, which is easier, Right, it's more complex than reservoir, but it's easier than other things. In this case, the question is about if the well found gas oil shows or thermogenic front. So thermogenic front, talk to your petroleum systems people, they know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the presence of thermogenic hydrocarbons in isotubes, right? And most of you collect isotubes, um, so if not, you should. So if you actually see thermogenic hydrocarbons, right? So basically you see migrating hydrocarbons through your system. So it's not a it's not a migration failure anymore. It's not a source failure anymore, right? So now you start asking questions about derivability, right? Do you have enough permeability? Do you enough have enough fluid viscosity to enable flow, right? And if yes, you move to the seal. If the seal, if the top seal is present, right, then you can check for the structure, right? If the structure is present you can start asking questions about lateral seal because now you see you don't have an accumulation, but now you have a reservoir, you have migration, you have the top seal, right? So you have all the things. So maybe there is a lateral seal, right? So if lateral seal is present, right? Then you check if you penetrate it or not. And, you know, if if you uh, did not penetrate it, you know, when, when was it structure formation and you can come to, you know, lateral bottom seal failure or to migration time failure. Right. Or alternatively, you can go this path if you don't have the shows, right? If you don't have thermogenic front, you check for your structure, right? And maybe there is no structure, that's why you don't have, you know, thermogenic migrating through, or uh, maybe there is no uh, mature source, or maybe there is no migration. So the idea is you start with simple things to check for reservoir and shows, and then move to more close things like uh, closure. Right, because now you have to remap your closure, right? So after you drill the well and um, and and lateral seals. But the end result is you come up with one failure mode, one key failure mode. And the benefits, the, the numerous benefits here, one of the benefits is consistency. Right? So essentially, if you know the rules that you that you set up and you give the same data to different geoscientists right, they can come up with the same answer for the failure mode. And that's important. And uh, so because I, I, I do this in my courses, right? So when I give exercise with this decision tree during my classes and courses for the industry, people usually come up with the same uh, failure mode. 
that's important because that drives decision la decisions later on. If you disagree on the failure mode in your meeting, you know, what, what kind of actionable items are you actually taking out? So this actually gives you this opportunity to, to kind of agree, I guess. Um, what else? So consistency is one thing. Also, the process becomes quite simple and quick. Right, so companies that use this decision tree or similar decision trees, they tell me that their meetings become very short. <laughs> so they don't spend like half day talking about failure modes anymore because they have a very clear algorithm of making that decision. And some people like it, right? Especially managers. Some people don't necessarily like it, who you know like to you know sit and discuss geology and arm wave. So, but as a manager, because I'm coming to this as a manager, right? I want consistent decision from my people. I enjoy scientific discussions as much as everybody else, but at the end of the day, I need to act to improve my exploration results, right? So this type of algorithm allows me to do that. Let me give you a quick example, and it's a published example. So uh, there's a paper where you publish this. Uh, we're gonna look at a well called Romney, Romney 1. It was drilled offshore New Zealand by Anadarka. Um, back in 2013. So New Zealand is another country which is good with uh, open source uh, data. So they basically release a lot of uh, subsurface information in about three, four, five years uh, after they collect that information. So um, it's, uh, it's it was possible for to get seismic data from New Zealand in 3D, to get all the pre-drill reports by Anadarka, to get the post-drill reports, right? So. Uh, I, I work a lot with this open source data. So in this case, this Romney one well, which was a frontier well in deep water Taranaki basin. So this is Taranaki basin shallow, and this is deep water Taranaki basin, you know, frontier well. Um, they targeted this North Cape formation, primary target. So that's kind of where it is on seismic. It's a structural four-way closure. It's pretty bizarre closure. It's very small, as you will see. Uh, late Cretaceous Reservoir, Marine Sands, uh, shales above sandstones and seals. Uh, the source was thought to be this uh, Pro Delta Shelf, uh, Pro, Pro Delta Shale, sorry, uh, in the Taranaki Delta sequence. It's essentially over there. So that's where they were thinking there would be source. It was not proven, right? So, and they drilled through it to prove it. And the key pre drill risk was source presence and maturity, simply because nobody knew if that source it would actually be present. It's the first well, it's that frontier well, so it was likely to fail for source rock presence. And now that they deal the well, right, we can actually go through the decision tree to identify why the well failed, right? So, and we start with reservoir fascias, right? So we look at well logs, we look at cuttings, and basically the well logs do show the presence of reservoir fascias. Now, um, the the net to growth is relatively low, right? So, but there is, you know, about 300 meters of growth reservoir. And that's where, you know, people start, you know, having debates. What exactly is the reservoir and how, you know, high the net to growth should be and porosity and permeability and all these, right? So for me, it's as simple as, you know, if there is some sandstones in your formation, you have a reservoir, right? So that the answer was yes. Right, and then we look at uh, at um, presence of shows and thermogenics. So there was no shows in that formation, like no shows. And this is data from isotubes. I'm sorry, it's a table data, but it's okay. So basically, this yellow interval is uh, North Cape formation, and we can see that there is very low concentration of methane in isotubes, and very low concentration of heavy hydrocarbons. These, they are so low, it was actually impossible to measure isotope values. Even so, you know, they were measured above and below that formation. In the formation above, the isotope value of clearly microbial gas. Formation below is thermogenic gas, um, but nothing in this one. So basically, we conclude that there is no shows, right? No uh, thermogenic front in this well. And the next thing would be to test for for the structure, right? Did the well actually is the well located inside the structure? Um, so this is a pre-drill interpretation from Anadarka, 
and this is a post drill interpretation from from my student and we basically conclude yeah the structure is there it's small right so that's kind of where it is on seismic lines so it's small it's bizarre but it's it's there okay it's a low relief structure the next question would be to test for source rock presence and this well actually penetrated the predicted source rock interval and confirms that it's present right so basically this is um at the base of the well there is toc which is not high uh and hydrogen index not, not high but the source rocks are mature and that's why hydrogen index are relatively low right because it's already mature source rock and you can see vitreant reflectance is about 0.91 so essentially it's kind of in the what we call oil window so the source rock is present and the source rock is mature right um so back to our decision tree, right? So we found the reservoir fascias. We, we found no shows. It's inside the structure. The source rock is present, right? So why the well failed? Migration. Right, so the well failed for migration. Yeah, sorry, somebody's trying to talk over me. Um, now, if you look, if you look at this well location and, and the segment, Right, so the source rock is, is always there. So what's between the source rock and this segment? Volcanics. Right, so essentially it's relatively easy to imagine that whatever hydrocarbons migrate to towards this segment are actually trapped behind below the volcanics. So volcanics essentially serves as a seal, right, for the deeper segment, which was another target, but also it prevents migration of hydrocarbons into the shallow segment called North Cape. So just by looking at this simple 2D, you know, interpretation, you can imagine, you know, that migration is not a bad candidate for failure mode. Now, that was not Anadarka's interpretation. They had a different interpretation for the failure mode because they had different workflow and believed different data. So, uh, yeah, so Anadarka basically said it's a seal. Seal is a failure mode. Right, because they found very low ceiling capacities in the shales overlaying the North Cape. So, and that's good, right? So, but this has the thing, right? Very low ceiling capacity doesn't mean no ceiling capacity, right? Very low ceiling capacity affects the column height that this segment potentially can hold, right? Which is also a function of your oil properties. For example, if the oil is relatively heavy, right? Even low ceiling capacity can hold a column. But they found seal, sealing fascias, right? So there is a seal, there is a seal above the North Cape. It's just in their mind, it was low sealing capacity. In my mind, that's uncertainty. In my mind, that's not a failing mode. Another thing, they saw evidence of hydrocarbon fluid inclusions in the segment. And for me, and that's why I'm kind of biased with my petroleum systems, I don't believe fluid inclusions. I believe my isotubes because isotubes test the pore space and fluid inclusions can be whatever, right? Can be redeposited from, you know, some other places. So that's my, you know, interpretation bias. What I, what data actually I believe. So that's why I'm saying it's very important to define the rules inside your company for how you actually, uh, what you call a failure, and how you approach your your failure interpretations. Because if you don't have that, there will be disagreements, right? So, like I said, we published uh, we published actually two papers on this. So this is a first paper where we describe the decision tree in details and the logic for it and application to uh, to that well, to that Romney well, to two segments in the Romney well. And this is the second paper where we apply decision tree to uh, three other segments also in New Zealand. So basically, we tested this decision tree on five different segments. So if you want to get into the more technical uh, technical details of this, you can read these papers um, and you can always send me a request for PDF. Now, why it's important uh, for me as a manager to have this consistent process for decision making, right? Because that was my motivation for this study, because I sat in too many meetings when things were just, you know, conversations and not, not actionable items. At the end of the day, that's kind of what I want, right? So when you have numerous wells, drilled and numerous segments failed, you want to compare your uh, predicted failure modes with your actual failure modes, right? And see if you 
are able as a company to predict well your failure modes or not, right? So this is kind of, this is a simple table when you look at this. So basically this is source, right? So you predicted it on nine segments, all right? But when you actually drill the wells, drill the segments, right? It actually happened only in, uh, in two, right? It actually happened only in two. And then for migration, you predicted it's going to fail in 14 cases, and it only failed in one case for migration. And in seven other cases, it was actually reservoirs that fail, even so you predicted that as a migration. You see what I mean, right? So now if you're completely correct in your pre-drill predictions, then basically you would have zeros in everywhere except for these uh, cells, right? So these cells would be, the, would be basically your uh, field cells and everything else would be zeros. So now you can look at and see, you know, why you fail, you, why your wells fail in most of the cases on predictions, right? In this case, you see um, actual number of failures are mostly around reservoir, right? But your predicted was mostly around the seal. So obviously, right? And there are lots of details you can go into this. But basically, as a company, you do not do well at predicting your failing modes, which means you don't understand your geology ultimately, right? So to be simple and blunt, and blunt about that. What does it mean? It means that you need to improve, right? And for example, if your, if your reservoir fails in most cases, well, that's where you need to invest your money for learning opportunities, right? For data collection, for processes and so on and so forth. And if it's a seal, then it's a you know different direction that you have to go. So ultimately, that's what I want as a VP exploration manager, technical manager, right? From this failing mode analysis, right? But you can only do that when you have a good process behind, good definitions and good uh, good decision tree. Otherwise, your uh, you know decisions at the end of this analysis are going to be wrong, right? So because if it's all inconsistent. And you know somehow by random numbers you end up that you know reservoir is most often failure, uh, and you actually start investing into that. But actually it was a seal. Well, you just continue doing wrong things, right? So that's kind of the idea. That's kind of the idea. Um, I know you had discussions about failing modes, you know, in this meeting, and that's great. And I was not part of that because you know we're on different time zones. If you don't have a decision tree, try it. Right, try it on your next well, on your next failed segments. What's the benefits that you may see? Shorter debates, <laughs> right? I know people like debates, um, but they should be productive, right? So they should not be just for the sake of debates. So companies' feedback to me when they actually started using this type of tree is that their debates became shorter, right? So instead of whole day failure sessions, they could do it in one hour. Right, because there's an algorithm of how to make a decision. It's a data driven decision about the failing mode, right? So remember behind each of these move, is it reservoir, is it is it you know structure, there is a data, right? You actually have to prove yourself, right? If you think it's a structure, you have to come back with a remapped structure using your VSP data, your well log data, your well ties, and so on and so forth. Right? So you need to actually do the work. So it's a data driven decision. And it's a more justified improvement plan after consistent analysis of numerous wells. So that's kind of what I was talking about in the last slide, right? So uh, because now you've done your analysis of failing modes on a statistically significant number of the wells, so you know where you make mistakes. And you can do it for the company level, play level, basin level, right? Whatever, whatever you allow to do with, your, with, with the number of your statistics. But then you have a justified improvement plan. It's no longer, you know, we have this training budget and we're going to go and do all these different courses or do only one, right? So you actually justify what you need to improve exploration performance of your company. Again, if you predict that your reservoir is going to fail in most risk models, but it's actually migration that fails, well, maybe you need to update your petroleum system capabilities, whatever it means, and the other way around, right? So you understand. So that's kind of my uh, last uh, slide, and I'm sure there are questions, I'm sure there are comments. If you want PDF of these papers, just send me an email, right? So I'm always happy to help. 
And if you want to, you know, do exercises around this, you know, I teach uh, volumes and risk assessment to companies. So approach me and we'll find time for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Presentation very interesting. Um, it's all about consistent. And there are a couple of questions here. Um, so we'll start with Mark Hall. You spoke about defining success on segments rather than wells, but in your UK case, you suggest that finding a different reservoir from the pre drill model is still a success case. Isn't this contradictory? Surely, if your model is wrong, it is a failure. We may have been lucky with something else, but that doesn't help us learn for the next evaluation. You're muted, Alexei. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. Let's get to that specific case, uh, right? So, right. So, yeah, so first, so first it's actually two different parts of the question. Yeah, so I separate wells and segments. Why? Uh, because your analysis, your initial analysis is done on the segments, right? So that's what most of you use GeoX. So that's what we start with in GeoX, right? You basically do analysis of the segment. And then uh, for that segment, you create that risk model and you describe that segment, right? So in this case, you know, the segment was described as, you know, pan sandstone, right? And probability of success, let's say 0.9. And, you know, and then there was a volumetric assessment of it with, you know, thickness and net to growth and porosity, all good stuff. So, but then when you drill a well, maybe you drill it on multiple segments, right? So maybe your prospect has multiple segments. So in this case, that's, I don't know if that was the case or not, Looks maybe not, right? So, but if you have multiple segments in your prospect, then your well would have a different probability of success and it would potentially be success in one segment, but not the others, right? So let's, let's, let's separate that. So ultimately, when you do your post-drill analysis, right? So the failure modes, should be for the segment, right? Not for the well. For the well, you can use statistical analysis, right? So in this case, for example, let's say there was another segment over here and the well was successful in another segment, which wasn't even predicted. Well, that well is still a discovery well, right? You still count that as a discovery, but you need to somehow in your database find a way to describe that it was not in the segment that you predicted. Now, Another question is, you know, what we do with this one now? Why I think it's actually uh, reservoir is successful? Well, because the reservoir is present, right? In the segment that you assess, the reservoir is present. That's why for me, it's a success now, but this is a failure of your geological description. If it has a different name, <laughs> right? If it's a different type of target. But this, but in this case, it's not like target is different, right? It's actually at the same depth, right? It's mapped kind of in the same location. It's not like in a completely different stratigraphy. So, but again, this is just my view. And that's where you need to have this type of discussions in your process conversation, right? And you know better what type of situations you usually run into and where your debates often happen. My point is, um, you have to have specific rules. So because you cannot come to that type of discussion in every meeting when you have failing mode for a specific segment, right? So you want to have that fundamental definitions inside your company set up that you can use later on and everybody else can use later on. Now, obviously, after like five years, you can come back and revise your process, right? But you don't want to do this too often also. So, yeah. Did so I have a question? question? Uh -huh. um, and this is from uh, Jeremy Thiebaud. I always wonder how ranking most common failure mode is representative of the reality. Since, for example, when the failure is absence of reservoir, you get no information on charge, structure, trap that could be failure also. Right. And this discussion about insufficient charge versus sea leakage. Right. So that's a good question, right? So, I mean, um, yeah. So, so this is kind of, you know, lumped up everything. So, but probably let's go back to decision tree 
And let's let's talk about this because this is fundamentally important. So here's the thing. Can the, can the sigma segment fail for multiple reasons, right? So for example, if there is no reservoir, but there was also no charge because the source rock was also immature and there was also no structure, right? Yes, absolutely. And that's why some other, uh, you know, companies and workflows and consultants like Tech Player, for example, right? They have these um, wheels with, you know, different failure modes. Can that happen? Yes, it can. Now, here's the thing. If if there is no reservoir present, right, um, then, you know, how migration can actually happen into it, right? That's that's a bigger question, right? Is the migration absent because there is no, there is no soul stroke and focus, or it's simply because there is no, you know, conductive lithology for migration, right? So that's where it becomes, it becomes complex. But also, you know, it's different purposes. What exactly, what exactly you're trying to solve, right? So in this case, what I'm trying to solve is um, simplicity of discussion that actually leads to business decisions. Now, when I do play mapping and play risking, do I want to account for all these other potential failure modes? Yes, right? How do I do that? So for this well, for example, right, on the play map, uh, there is no, on reservoir map, right, there is no reservoir, right, but on migration map, there is no migration. So you can actually indicate that, right? Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's a very, very good conversation about key failure mode versus, you know, all the potential failure modes. The question is why, right? Why, what, what, what are we using this information for? What kind of decision we are actually driving? Right, and with this decision tree about the key failure mode, what I'm driving is understanding of why our wells inside a company fail the most, and where I want to put my technical limited, you know, budget and you know people efforts. What what problem I want to I want to fix? Right now, in the background, we can account for all other, you know absent elements of the petroleum system in the play maps and we have to do that right but play maps have a different business objective <laughs> right so it's kind of from in my mind it's not either or right but i think that this one is important because again ultimately you know i want to get to this type of evaluation and discussion and if you have multiple failure modes you cannot do that So start start with the end in mind, right? What what are you doing this for? What are you doing failure analysis for? If you're trying to fix your company's exploration performance, it's probably key failure mode. If you're trying to improve your play maps, it's 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 all all information, all information. Yeah, that's a good distinction there. I think between <clears throat> failure mode and um, and play maps, mm -hmm. and geological understanding. Yeah. Um, so we have one last comment. Um, I, I see we've spent a long time here now, but I, I think it's very interesting. So we'll allow that one last comment. Um, and it's from Per Back. Alexei, thank you for your presentation. Anna Darko's conclusion of seal failure might have been of strategic sort? Question mark. Um, right. So I don't know. Right. It's kind of a kind of a speculation. Uh, so I, and I don't know. I when we had conversations with them, I did not feel it was strategic. I move. I felt more that it was kind of people agenda driven. Right. So it's uh, it's who actually like, for example, right. So when you sit there and, and this is not going to be about you know, another and specific mm -hmm. people, a general conversation. Right. So when you sit there and talk about failure mode. Right. And basically you don't have, you know, you, you're a petroleum systems person and you built a model, you know, to demonstrate migration and you don't find, you know, you know, obvious, obvious evidence for migration. Right. What's your what's your defensive mechanism, right? Natural defensive mechanism. Well, you're going to try to find something, right? To defend that your model was was right, right? So basically, 
That's exactly the idea behind you know decision trees and rules to remove all these biases, all right? And don't have people to fight too much for their own work pre-drill. And don't try, you know, the idea is not to put blame on people, right? The idea is to establish some kind of a truth, right? But the simpler is the process, the easier is for people to agree on that, you know, truth, whatever, whatever it is, right? So uh, what you're talking about is a possibility, all right? But that's, you know, my whole work is about removing all these, you know, biases. And some of them, them are personal, some of them can be company, you know, what you said, you know, strategic reason, right? If that, but that's the wrong reason, right? So it doesn't help them in the future exploration, right? Maybe it helps them to, you know, to stay out of this basin for some manager who doesn't like it, right? But it's all kind of, you know, people, people type conversations, right? I think scientifically we still need to establish, establish the truth. Right. Good question. Thank yeah. you very much, Alexei. I think that sums up um, the questions and comments that we had in the chat. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be available to discuss a lot more if people are interested. And as yeah. you said, um, um, feel free to contact you to, to get any papers, etc. Yep. Um, so lastly, I'd like to thank you all for participating. And um, I'd also like to say thank you to Lynn Smerud for helping us set up the teams and, and organize everything. So it's worked quite smoothly, I think. Um, and I guess the last thing remains to be said is have a really nice evening and thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Bye bye.